welcome and introduce you to you, Alexander Keith, the writer based in Los Angeles. His work has appeared in Bidun, East of Borneo, and Art Form, among others. Keith did graduate work in Sanskrit and Indian studies at Harvard University and later taught as an assistant professor at Ohio University, a 2001 grantee of the Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant Program. He has also received a Fulbright for research in India and currently holds the inaugural Alan Erasmus Fellowship in Unpopular Culture at New York Scorpion for Unpopular Culture. I would like also to remind everyone that tonight uh, Alexander will be at Beirut Arts Center at 8 for a listening session, so uh, feel free to be there as well. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Wonderful invitation to come to Beirut uh, to participate in a festival at Beirut Art Center uh, dedicated to listening and sound. And one of the one of the suggestions or one of the ideas that I came up with was to try to draw a kind of comparison between the generation of John Cage and the generation of Lamont Young by focusing in a very specific way upon two trips to India that they made. One, the 1964 world tour of the Cage Cunningham Company, or the Cunningham Dance Company with John Cage in tow, and one, a later trip uh, in 1971 by Lamont Young, Terry Riley, and Marion Zazila. So I'm going to start by going into some detail about the Cunningham, uh, the Merce Cunningham Dance Company's world tour in 1964. The Cunningham Dance Company, and this is a picture of them performing a dance called Ion in 1964. Um, that's Steve Paxton on the left. Uh, the Cunningham Dance Company arrived in Bombay in October of 1964 after a grueling European leg of their inaugural world tour. While the US government had generously sponsored foreign tours by dance companies like Martha Graham's for many years, Cunningham's company was still too far on the outs for such government largesse. They had to put this one together on their own, and the logistics were proving to be a nightmare. So was getting paid. Nerves were on edge, bodies were beyond bruised, and so were several mighty egos. One of them, Robert Rauschenberg, who had just won the 1964 uh, Painting Prize in Venice, becoming the first American painter to win this prize, which was a huge deal and had attracted a massive amount of publicity, which really pissed off Merce Cunningham. Uh, and so were several mighty egos. In fact, by the time the tour was half over, India will have done to the Cunningham Company much what it did to Alexander the Great's army, marking a kind of limit and a kind of death. The glory days of the Cunningham Company were ending. But that's skipping ahead. For John Cage, seen here in 1964, who accompanied the tour as musical director, it was a dream come true. Carolyn Brown, one of the principal dancers for the company, remembers him saying he was glad he had lived his life in such a way that it made it possible for him to be in India. And what way was that? Well, one can guess by the reception crew. Gita Sarabhai, seen here on the right, familiar, known familiarly as Gita Men, whom Cage had first met as an impecunious and largely unknown young composer in New York in 1946, during the middle of a catastrophic personal crisis and the collapse of his marriage to Xenia, Gita Ben was there to meet him. When she came to New York, she was an ambitious, bright, young musical scion of one of India's most elite families, and she was there to study Western music. Basically, John Cage, who at this time had stopped composing music due to this personal crisis, entered into a kind of educational exchange with Gita. Gita was a student of, serious student of Indian music before she came to New York, but she was probably following the principle of know thy enemy uh, and coming to New York to study 12-tone serialism and other aspects of modern Western music. Cage and Gita set up a kind of daily meeting where they would exchange information on Indian aesthetics and Indian philosophy on the one hand, and then Cage would teach her 12-tone serialism on the other. Cage had practically stopped composing before he began meeting almost every day with Gita Ben. She also gave him copies of several books by Sri Lankan-born art historian and cultural nationalist A.K. Kumaraswamy. What Cage took from his brief course of study of India was not so much as an appreciation of actual Indian music or art, but rather a set of dicta. One, that the purpose of music is to quiet the mind and make it susceptible to divine influence. Two, that art should not imitate nature in its form, but in its manner of operation. Cage 
John Cage's freedom from the messy vulgarities of living Indian musics allowed him to transform these sketchy premises into a full-blown and very American, very mid-century project for liberation, or better and more American still, freedom. After a brief but productive flirtation with these somewhat Indian aesthetics, shared by Merce at the time, Cage found himself drifting ever more firmly in the direction of Zen, then being taught in New York by the venerable D.T. Suzuki. But he never gave up his ties to the Sarabai clan or to India. And this was a wise move. Cage was no doubt aware of the Sarabai's reputation for artistic patronage and extreme wealth. What made keeping in touch rather more easy than it would have been for the average John was that the Sarabai family was extremely cosmopolitan, traveled frequently, and maintained active correspondence with a global network of friends and acquaintances. It was through the Sarabais that the Cunningham Company had been invited to India, and they were going to pay for almost the whole thing to boot. So for Cage, arriving in India, being greeted at the Bombay airport by his old friend. But India was not ready for John Cage, or for Merce Cunningham for that matter. Perhaps indicative of the problem is the fact that their first performances in Bombay were sponsored by an organization called the Bombay Madrigal Singers Organization. <laughs> As Brown remembers, our sold out audiences were unresponsive and members of the Sarabai family, seeing the company for the first time, appeared bewildered, a bit unhappy and strangely quiet. Gita Ben was seeing for the first time just what she'd wrought. John was crushed by the lambasting given the music. The Times of India advised its readers, do go and hear this very advanced art, so advanced that it appears to have caught up with the chaos of primeval slime. In its second review, it commented, to the uninitiated, it was not so much a performance on a prepared piano as a peevish assault on an unprepared piano. <laughs> Poor John, naively believing that because he so admired India, India would respond in kind. The Bombay shows did not go well, but things were looking up by the time they reached Sarabai Central, the western Indian city of Ahmedabad, which the family was almost single-handedly positioning for a leadership role in the emergence of a modern, non-aligned India. This is very fuzzy, but Bombay is here and Ahmedabad is quite nearby. It's a center of textile industry going back centuries, and this is how the Sarabais had made their money. This was kind of their home base. Fostering an archipelago of alt-modern institutions that ranged from the nation's first Montessori school, seen here in dilapidated present-day condition. This was designed by an architect named B.V. Doshi, who was Corbusier's assistant. Um, to the research facilities for India's nascent space and nuclear programs. Brown describes the scene of their arrival. Our night train, the Gujarat Mail, pulled into Ahmedabad early the next morning. On the platform to greet us were other members of the Sarabai family, whose guests we would be for five extraordinary days. Sorted into several cars, we made our way out of the teeming city into the countryside. Waiting at the gate of a walled-in compound was a band of musicians from the local jail, dressed in white with red and gold epaulets and fezzed turbans who serenaded us with bagpipes, drums, and other instruments. When all the automobiles had assembled, our caravan proceeded into the Sarabai compound with the band bringing up the rear, still playing. The frenetic hurly-burly of Bombay quickly receded as we inhaled the tranquil oasis of the retreat, a tropical paradise of trees, flowers, shrubs, lily ponds, and pavilions of intricate mogul-inspired decoration with peacocks strutting around under luxuriant foliage among Indian and Greek statues. Set amid the vast acreage was the main house, a four-story structure with terraces and balconies large enough to accommodate 50 house guests with a complete apartment for each of Ambalal Sarabai's seven adult children. Uh, this is a house that had played host to Osama Noguchi in the 50s, as well as Ale Alexander Calder, and continued to play host to many artists in, uh, right up into the present day. In time, each one of the adult children had come to construct their own home, and one of them is the Sarabai Villa, which is an important early work by Corbusier, which was designed as, uh, as the residence for one of the Sarabai children. And some of the lucky company members actually stayed in this residence later when Rauschenberg came back to India. He always stayed here. And you'll notice it has a Corbusier water slide from the second floor into the pool, which I think is the only one of those. Corbusier had designed a series of five buildings in Ahmedabad in the early 1950s, four of which were completed, including the Atma building. This is the Ahmedabad Textile Mill Owners Association building, and was also obviously closely involved with Sarabai patronage, uh, as well as 
the Sanskar Kendra, uh, which he designed as a, uh, as a, it was meant to be a museum, it was never quite complete, and now it's in terrible condition. But it also played home to uh, the nation's Ford Foundation funded and Charles Ames inspired National Institute of Design, founded of course by two of the Sarabai children. However, their performance itself was held somewhere a bit less, prepossess er, less prepossessing, a somewhat art deco building called the Mungledas Town Hall with terrible acoustics and a lousy floor designed by the colonial all-rounder Claude Batley in the 1930s, and that is not it. Sorry, I, I skipped ahead. Our Amdabad performances were in the Mungledas Town Hall where seats in the gallery could be had for just one rupee. Toilets were simply holes in the concrete floor. Accounts of the company's time in Ahmedabad read much like accounts of other artists' time visiting the Sarabai clan there, a tradition that started as early as the 40s and 50s and arguably stretches back to earlier pre-colonial patronage practices. They were treated, in short, like tourists, VIP tourists to be sure, but tourists nonetheless, protected from street food, entertained with hokey staged cultural evenings, uh, featuring dance and poetry and things like that, puppets. Unfortunately, the royal treatment could not prevent the long-stewing bad vibes between Cage and Cunningham on the one hand and Robert Rauschenberg on the other from boiling over. Rauschenberg was on the tour to design sets and design costumes, but as I said, having won the painting prize in Venice during the middle of the European leg of the tour, his fame suddenly was skyrocketing. And so there was a major clash of egos. By the time the company left, Rausch left Ahmedabad, Rauschenberg and Cage had had it out. Rauschenberg demanded the return of $1,000 that he had lent the company very recently, and after the end of the tour, he would not work again with Cunningham and Cage until the year of 1976. After Ahmedabad, the company performed in Chandigarh, the Corbusier-designed city, and Delhi. The trip was a disaster from this point on, with hotel reservations messed up, buses not arriving on time, the usual frustrations of travel amplified by frayed nerves in India itself. The Sarabais had scheduled the stop in Chandigarh because they thought everyone would want to see Corbusier-designed city. While they were there, they performed in the Tagore Theater, designed by one of Corbusier's team, a young arch Indian architect named Aditya Prakash. This had just been completed in 1961, and according to accounts of the performance, there still wasn't electricity in the building. Uh, and backstage, there was ironing of the costumes was being done by a 10-year-old boy whose iron was heated on a charcoal brazier attended by a still smaller, younger boy. But interesting, and this is a shot of the stage at the Tagore Theater, but interestingly, the less westernized their audience was, at least as the company perceived it, the more they enjoyed the performance. This was a pattern repeated throughout the company's time in India, which was their first stop after Europe, after all. What wonderful audiences, one of the dancers said of the Punjabis, totally unwesternized, they responded to the dances with uninhibited gusto, whether laughing and applauding with childlike glee in the middle of the dances when we jumped and leaped, or gasping in shock whenever a man lifted or even touched a woman. At moments, they became suddenly silent. Whether in awe or bewilderment, we never knew. They also never got paid. Long story, more bad vibes. Supposedly on their way out of town, the manager of the theater, the Stagora Theater, told John Cage apologetically, if we'd known how good you were, we wouldn't have treated you so badly. Back in Delhi, being back in Delhi meant being back in official India, though their performances, again, weren't exactly universally praised. The Times of India began its review of their first night in Delhi with the line, the Merce Cunningham Dance Company danced for a Delhi audience at the Fine Arts Theater on Thursday night, and unless forcibly prevented, will do so again on Friday night. However, there was something about the comp Cunningham Company in India that transcended the actual content of its performances. Their presence there itself constituted a kind of performance. On the Sarabai's part, to be sure, demonstrating the reach of their cosmopolitan and their commitment to sort of Cold War internationalism, but also on Cage and Cunningham's part. It was a thumb in your eye to the US government cultural bureaucrats and their own internationalist gesture made during the Cold War. Perhaps unsurprisingly, their social lives in Delhi were dominated by a kind of kabuki theater of government officials, though Merce was by then too unwell to attend most of the parties. For instance, they had a party actually at the American Embassy, which had been designed by the architect Darrell Stone in 1950s. Quite an imposing structure with interior gardens and, uh, and swimming pools. Uh, 
uh, they also had a party at the Mexican, uh, uh, the home of Octavio, Octavio Paz, who was the Mexican ambassador to Delhi at that time, uh, at a building that was recently listed for sale for $110 million. Um, this is another building that they visited at, during that time in Delhi. This is just to give a sense of the sort of modernity, the sort of willful modernity of the Cunningham tour of India in 1964. By the time they left India, bound for Bangkok via Calcutta, the Indian leg of the 1964 tour had passed into company legend, and not in a good way. Perhaps this was because it so effectively encapsulated why the tour itself was an unmitigated disaster financially and morally, albeit an apocal event for the rest of the world. The injuries, the infighting, the egos, what Cage and Cunningham saw as Rauschenberg's unforgivable grandstanding, it's a little remark that the official straw that broke the camel's back, by all accounts, was a press conference Rauschenberg gave in Tokyo during the company's final stop, where he allegedly said that my greatest canvas is the Merce Cunningham Dance Company. And Merce did not take that the right way. By this time, so much of the press attention was being devoted to Rauschenberg that Merce and Cage were reaching a breaking point. Things had already boiled over in Ahmedabad, in the heart of one of post-colonial India's most hopeful urban, cultural, and educational experiments. I always imagine them fighting in Corbusier's Villa Sarabai. Corbusier is stage and set for the Cage Rauschenberg face off and final fuck off. But in Tokyo, what amounted to an intensive residency at the Sogetsu Art Center, things fell apart when Cage and Cunningham arrived late and left early for a live Rauschenberg painting event. Rauschenberg quit the company in a peak. It later emerged that Merce had left early to try to head off one of the dancers at the airport who was also leaving early. Basically, at the end of the Merce Cunningham tour, the world tour, all of the original company kind of came apart. Very few of the original dancers remained. One of the dances they performed on the tour was Winter Branch, when you see an image from it here with the dancer Carolyn Brown next to Merce. It's a dark, enigmatic piece for six dancers that Merce put together in 1964, just in time for rehearsals for the world tour. Aptly described by Cunningham archivist David Vaughn as Merce at his most uncompromising, Winter Branch consists of falls, slow falls, fast falls, arching falls, leaping falls, turning falls, serpentine twisting falls, supported falls, all connected by pedestrian, walking, dragging, rolling, and crawling. Many people saw it as a very violent dance. For the dancers, it could be excruciating, and not just because of the dance's preternatural slowness. It's a glacially slow dance. But it was also the sound. Although the dance begins in total silence, it certainly didn't stay that way. Perhaps responding to the dance's bleak darkness and its implicit sense of violence, company music director John Cage did the still very young composer Lamont Young the great honor of selecting one of his pieces as the accompanying music. Clive Barnes, dance critic who was in attendance at one of the world tour performances, described it like this in a review. Winter Branch is an exercise in fear and intimidation. The dancers wear tracksuits in black, and black bars of grime are slashed across their cheeks. Bodies roll over in unloving, unfunny judo. A group piles up, buddy buddies afraid of the dark, afraid of the crunch. The mood of the ballet is like a dark stain on blotting paper. At times you want to shout out to the people on stage that it's all right, it's only a game, damn it. But you hardly like to, and you take refuge in suppressed, embarrassed laughter. At last the silence comes to a climax, and you have the noise of Lamont's young, Lamont Young's music to hide away from, so you can think yourself down from the pain threshold of the music. It takes the mind off the creeping sickness on stage, and suddenly, like a flatulent red-nosed comic on dead cue, an object half familiar wholly terrifying trundles across, and this is hysterically funny. Myth and technology combine to make a joke of a nameless terror and make it with domestic objects put to undomestic use. The dancers completely hated Lamont's piece, which was played at ear-splitting volume, and it's a, it's a piece that Lamont put together in 1960 called, uh, called Two Sounds. I, I thought maybe I could play it a quick excerpt of it just to give a sense, but I'm not sure if I can master the technology. Uh, I won't play all, this off. You have to imagine it quite a bit louder. So you can hear, this is a piece that Lamont put together on tape in 1960. 
And it, what, it, what it basically consists of is him and his, his buddy Terry Riley scraping pieces of glass with metal to create these crazy friction sounds. Lamont was in the process of making a lot of music like this. He had been to Darmstadt in 1958 and seen David Tudor making music by moving chairs and scraping things on the ground. He came back to Berkeley and took this much further by making entire suites of music. And so the piece goes on like this. And uh, unfortunately, at this volume, it's, it's pretty hard to, to make out what's, what's actually wonderful about it. Let me see if I can get my picture viewer back up. Ah, yeah. There, there's the young Mr. Young. Cor composer Cornelius Cardew, who was also in attendance at one of the performances, wrote this. One further composition reached England in 1964 when the Merce Cunningham Dance Company was at Sadler's Wells in the Phoenix Theater for a season. Cunningham had choreographed a composition called Two Sounds. The composer had provided two sounds on separate tapes to be started at different points during the ballet. When the first sound starts, you cannot imagine that any more horrible sound exists in the whole world. Then the second sound comes in, and you have to admit you were wrong. Sensitive Cardew, intuiting that there must be something here other than neurotic violence and ugliness. And a lot of the early reactions to Lamont Young's music essentially focused on it as a kind of anti-music, and a kind of prank, or as a kind of extreme ugliness. Uh, this was basically a total misunderstanding of what he was trying to do. It would be an understatement to say that some found the music grating, but then they kind of had a point. The piece had, in fact, been conceived and executed by scraping metal against glass. Lamont did it with the help of a man he'd only met quite recently, but with whom he would become closely linked, Terry Riley, then just 23 years old. Terry had met Lamont in Berkeley in 1958, or as he later put it, I sort of got into his gravitational field. <laughs> Lamont and I became kind of inseparable, he says, of that period when their fellow graduate students at Berkeley included Pauline Oliveros. I just remember we were never apart. He would come over to my house and we'd always be listening to records or transcribing stuff or talking about different things. He was into Coltrane, early Coltrane, before anybody knew John Coltrane. And as an aside, 1957 was the first year, or was the year that Coltrane's debut album came out. He had already had experience listening to Asian music earlier than I had, and he introduced me to Gagaku and even Indian music. Lamont's ideas about music were, to be imp were impressive to be sure, but so was his look. Again, from Terry Riley. Everything he did was different. He was extremely eccentric. He was avant-garde in his dress. He didn't wear any socks. He had this little goatee and beret, and he had long hair. This was the late 50s before the Beatles. So when I saw Lamont, I thought, oh yeah, this is a brother. Among other activities, the two participated as musicians in the dance workshops of legendary Bay Area dance group guru Anna Halperin, which were formative for both. And these are photos of Anna Halperin's dance workshops. Riley remembers being struck by the fact that the musicians themselves were considered to be part of the dance performance. So I actually considered myself a theatrical element while I was making music. It was an exciting way to react. It was also a chance to improvise with available objects and non-musical sounds. It was at one of these jam sessions that Lamont, with the help of Terry Riley, created two sounds. Lamont was still just 23 at the time, a few months younger than Riley, but already transforming into something like an enfant terrible and something like a guru. He hadn't been to India yet, at least not in the flesh, but he'd been there in ear all right beginning one auspicious day in 1957 when he caught the sounds of Ali Akbar Khan's Music of India morning and evening ragas wafting through UCLA's campus, the place where, instead of studying composition, Young studied ethnomusicology, in the place where the academic discipline of ethnomusicology itself was being invented, an experimental addition to a suite of new disciplines loosely grouped together under the name Area Studies and lavishly funded by institutions like the Ford Foundation. Ethnomusicology was no exception. UCLA's acquisition of the first gamelan ensemble imported to the United States from Java was paid for by the Ford Foundation, who also funded visits by living masters to the US, as well as field work abroad by American grad students, inaugurating the first successful, albeit problematic, inclusion of an Asian courtly music in a post-war academic context. Indeed, the story of this seminal recording by Ali Akbar Khan, recorded in April 1955 at MoMA in New York, is broadly illustrative of the deep entanglement between the arrival of Indian classical music in the United States and its Cold War internationalist context.
The performance was part of something called the Living Arts of India Festival, a multi-pronged event with music arranged by Indophilic violinist Yehudi Menuhin with funding from the Ford Foundation and John D. Rockefeller, who was in the process of setting up the Asia Society at that time. From UCLA's Ford Foundation funded acquisition of Gagaku instruments in a Javanese gamelan to Ali Akbar Khan's landmark recording, there was a concerted effort underway to create bridges between cultural elites and institutions in the United States and newly independent India, part of a bigger cultural diplomacy push into the free world, characterized by jazz band tours, Radio America, and the CCF. It's no coincidence that the Living Arts of India Festival that opened in January of that same year or the Living Arts of India Festival of 1955 shared space at MoMA with Edward Steichen's Family of Man, an exhibition that opened in January of that same year, filling the entire second floor of MoMA, and which by April was drawing such tremendous crowds that the museum had to expand their hours. An exhibition more emblematic of US ambitions for the post-war world would be hard to imagine. By the time the exhibition moved on, it later traveled to other US cities and some 37 countries abroad, a quarter million visitors had passed through a series of temporary walls. And this gives some sense of, of the way that the Family of Man show was hung at MoMA. Essentially, you see small images, big images, and it was hung in, in a way that visitors were encouraged to sort of move among them and piece together their own experience. It was quite an experimental curation. Khan's performance that April was recorded and distributed by Angel Records in the US, the same record that Young rushed out to purchase after hearing at UCLA, and has loomed large in any number of accounts of discovering Indian music in the late 50s and early 60s. Included were extensive liner notes drawn from the original MoMA program. Audience members, and by extension home listeners, were advised, in listening to the playing of a raga, we must remember that in India, the fine arts are approached as a spiritual experience. Both the audience and the artist participate in the music and together find in the performance an expression of divine beauty that is a manifestation of the eternal. Considering Lamont's later music, this feels prophetic and brings up the fact that once Khan's performance was put on vinyl, set out into the market, it would engage with audiences very different from the ones imagined by MoMA or by the cultural bureaucracy in New India. Spiritual experiences aside, bringing Indian music to New York was a serious business. And indeed, it's easy to imagine some rich old MoMA donor roped into coming to the event and dozing off before he even made it far enough in the program to be warned he was about to taste the eternal, whatever that was. But then imagine a teenager listening while lying on a bed in his grandma's house in LA with the shades drawn, a head full of hashish, and a profound if still budding desire to destabilize Western art music. This was not what MoMA and the Indian government had in mind. Just what did Young hear? Well, first in the recording, the first thing you hear is Yehudi Menuhin comes out and sort of introduces each instrument in order so that listeners, as they listen to this very seminal recording, would be able to sort of piece apart which is the tabla, which is the sarod in this case, and which is the tambura. Of course, the tambura is like a drone instrument, and this was, for Young, the most shocking thing he heard. In fact, the later parts of the record didn't introduce him at all. It's just that there's like a two-second snippet where Yehudi Menuhin says, this is the tambura instrument, and is being played by a man named Mr. Gore, and it provides the drone. Is played, uh, to help you on, uh, okay. It's somehow appropriate that side A of the record that follows consists of a performance of the Raga Sindh Parivri, which the liner notes and voiceover both explain is a morning Raga, a new notion to most, this connection between time and performance. Because in the sound of that one or two seconds of that naked tambura, this drone sound, Lamont Young heard an echo of the whistling power lines outside the cabin in southwestern Idaho, where he first heard what he later called the dream chord. Lamont claims that as a child, he actually grew up at first in this cabin before moving to LA when he was about eight. Lamont says that as a child, he used to hear the wind going through the chinks in the walls of his house and also going through the power lines that ran by. And these sort of formed a kind of aeolian harp effect that he later called the dream chord and became a very important part of his music. What happened when he heard the tambura drone on the Indian record that Ali Akbar Khan made was that a sort of synthesis of ideas came together in his head. That 
that these sort of uncreated, as it were, natural kind of sounds of the wind moving through things were also related to this Indian music and, and the idea of morning music versus afternoon music. All these things become very important to, to his later career. Young's early career, his exposure to the music of D D David Tudor, his study of serialism, his neo-data verbal compositions, his early minimalist works, all of this covers a terrain far too vast to explore in a talk. I must skip slightly ahead to a period around 1962 when Young's music and his theater entered a distinctly new phase, one that managed to combine avant-garde electronics and mid-century Cold War endophilia into a potent ayahuasca that he called the theater of eternal music. And this, this is a performance of Lamont Young performing with Tony Conrad on the left, Marion Zazila just to his right, and to the right of Marion is John Cale. The Theater of Eternal Music was an ensemble of young avant-gardenists who met daily in the loft studio of Lamont and Marion to practice and record their music. Every so often they even performed. What they played, whether practicing or rehearsing, were snatches drawn from several massive, sprawling, and incomplete compositions, such as The Tortoise, His Dreams, and Journeys. That's one of the titles. A piece without fixed score or dimensions. Instead of a score, its massive expansion is achieved through the application of improvisatory and ritualistically repetitive techniques applied to tiny pre-planned and semi-notated musical ideas that he called modules. These, impro these improvisations were guided by a set of rules, algorithms he called them, that excluded certain harmonic intervals, say, or included others. Performances were drawn from the tortoise piece and another similarly endless piece called Four Dreams of China. And they were given names that include information as the exact time and date the performance occurred, and sometimes a whole lot more information as well. For example, the first realization of the theater of eternal music under that name at New York's Pocket Theater in fall of 1964 was titled, The Tortoise Droning Selected Pitches from the Holy Numbers of the Two Black Tigers, the Green Tiger, and the Hermit. A performance a few weeks later had this for a title. The tortoise recalling the drone of the holy numbers as they were revealed in the dreams of the whirlwind and the obsidian gong and illuminated by the sawmill, the green sawtooth ocelot, and the high tension line step down transformer. It was quite a mouthful, but more than that, it was quite a headful. Jill Johnston vividly describes the scene in an enthusiastic piece in the village voice that concludes, the dissemination of culture by way of original tapes by Young in house, office, and brothel could conceivably raise the culture to an unusual level of sanity. To survey Young's relationship with Indian and Asian aesthetics and music in this period would alone fill at least two talks. Take for an example his mobilization of a profoundly Indian tortoise mythology as an organizing theme for the theater of eternal music. Lamont and Marion Zazila, his partner, had been given a pet turtle, which following conventional translation ease, they christened a tortoise. Not only did they build an elaborate heady mythology around this turtle, who they named 44 for obscure reasons, but they took it a step further, amplifying the sound of the aquarium motor to generate one of the Theater of Eternal Music's signature mega drones. So there's a little motor inside the aquarium of the turtle. They took the, the sound of this and essentially made it the basis for the drone for the Theater of Eternal Music's rehearsals. In ancient Indian mythology, or so they thought, the tortoise stands for staying still, for epically long durations of time, for the primordial at the base of the world. In a program note from 1964, he introduced his concept of the dream house, utopian mus musical research stations where drone music may play without stopping for thousands of years. And I'm just going to select a little bit from this text, but you can see the whole thing up there. He says, as in the life of the tortoise, the drone is the first sound. It lasts forever and cannot have begun, but is taken up again from time to time until it lasts forever as continuous sound in dream houses where many musicians and students will live and execute a musical work. Dream houses will allow music, which after a year, 10 years, 100 years, or more of a constant sound, would not only be a real living organism with a life and tradition all its own, but one with a capacity to propel itself by its own momentum. He envisioned a, a, a network of these dream houses where, where essentially single chords or single sort of constellations of, of sounds with massive drones would just be played for thousands of years. 
and, and, and sort of run as an experiment in what might happen. Uh, it will become easier as we move further into this period of sound. We will become more attached to sound, he writes. We will be able to have precisely the right sound in every dream room, playroom, and workroom, further reinforcing the integral proportions resonating through structure, dream house, at which performance, performers, students, and listeners may visit even from long distances away, or at which they may spend long periods of dream time, weaving the ageless quotients of the tortoise in the tapestry of eternal music. Lamont's mythopoetic grandeur, or is it grandiosity, and mind-bending prose may dream of India and borrow heavily from its archives, but there is an element of neo-orientalist kitsch to some, if not all, of his work from this period, especially in the theater of eternal music. Argentine critic, artist, and Lacanian Oscar Masota was in New York in 1966 and attended a performance by the ensemble at Larry Poon's Loft, then known as the Four Heavens, and you see there uh, one of the uh, invites. He did not like what he heard and saw. In a cheeky essay called I Committed a Happening, he called out the theater and their audience for a kind of ethnocentric narcissism and mirroring. I'm going to skip a long quote. There are some problems with Masota's account, and incidentally what he describes, uh, what he critiques is one of the first with Terry Riley as a member of the Theater of Eternal Music. Uh, but his ba the basic gist of his critique that, that for all of the sort of electronics and drones and people sitting around in yoga positions and Lamont and Marion with these essentially mandalas of light put over their bodies, which were like sort of costumes of light that Marion had designed and intended as a kind of votive image for people to meditate on while they were at these six hour performances. He saw all this as a kind of banal neo-Orientalism and he, he thought that as a kind of happening, it didn't carry any critical power. But he had a point. Lamont's India, much like Lamont's Japan, Lamont's China of the 1960s, was a Cold War daydream, amplified by the son of a Mormon sheep herder with a head full of grass and wild ideas about numbers, sounds, and eternity. His India, a kind of dream weapon to wield against, well, so many things, Europe for one, Western civilization, but while he was, as always, ahead of the game in that sense, a rebel soldier in the avant-garde, he was also part of the zeitgeist. This was a period when Indian stuff was becoming very familiar in New York and very boring for many people. India was coming to New York, and finally, some Indians as well. Lamont Young's magic mirror was about to point two ways. You see here, it's Pandapran not. I'm gonna start this last section of my talk with a quote from Lamont, and this is something he wrote in 1996 about the man he calls Guruji. Guruji predicted a state of continuous transmission of an ocean of spiritual love. So great was his love that he made each student feel that he loved them beyond all others, just as he did Krishna with Radha and each of the gopis. In fact, Guruji very much lived the life of Krishna. His life was charmed, and he was constantly surrounded by adoring disciples. Each chapter of his life was set in an array of miraculous occurrences and visionary apparitions. None of it would have happened if they hadn't lifted the Oriental Exclusion Act of 1924. Until the egregiously racist Immigration Act of 1924 was lifted in 1965, visits by actual Asians to the US were necessarily at least somewhat high level privileged affairs by people like Gita Sarabhai who met with Cage in the 40s or well-established Indian government approved artists uh, such as Ali Akbar Khan. Small fish in the Sarkari music world of all India radio like Pandit Pran not, uh, could hardly expect a coveted passport and ticket abroad. The end of the exclusion in 1965 brought with it to New York, a veritable flood of would-be gurus, yoga teachers, musicians skilled and otherwise, healers, and a surprising number of people who straddled the lucrative, incense-scented, entrepreneurial middle ground that somehow spanned all of the above. Among these latter men, as they almost all were, must be counted one Sham Patnagar, an ambitious young Indian man running, running a yoga ashram in New Jersey, whom Lamont and Marion met in 1967 at a concert. Gita Ben's guide to Indian aesthetics had been bookish, assimilated, and translated into ordinary English. 
and was adaptable by John Cage for his own purposes. It was, in short, exactly the kind of quote-unquote traditional India, one comfortably at home in the modern state, that the Sarabhais were hoping to project at home and abroad. De-peopled and unburdened by direct contact with living Indian musicians, Gita's introduction could hardly have been safer for Cage's Western palette. And Gita herself was a Montessori-educated cosmopolitan from one of the wealthiest families in India. To her, India was a pliable fantasy. To Cage, a pipe dream from the pages of a book. Sham Putnagar probably brought a book or two with him. Who knows and who cares? That wasn't important compared with what else he had brought from India, tapes of his teacher singing. Really, really good tapes. And he told him, you've got to hear this. His name is Pandit Pran Nath, and then he put on a recording. After hearing it, Lamont Young told Terry Riley, who was also in New York at that time, and anyone else who would listen, that he had never heard someone sing so perfectly in tune. Young had a legendarily good ear for pitch, and he simply could not understand what he was hearing. And that was enough. Lamont Young had found his source, had finally encountered an other he deemed worthy, Religious stories are full of parables like this, tales of some precocious but indomitable young buck brought to heel by the overwhelming charisma and power of a living saint. Rebel turns into devotee, disciple, and his submission carries that much force for it. Lamont later wrote, Guruji once gave me the example that a disciple should be like a sandal, ready for the teacher to step into and walk on. This was the devotion Guruji expected, and this was the devotion that allowed him to transmit spiritual love to the disciple on the highest level. By the spring of 1970, Lamont and Marion had teamed up with Sham Patnagar to bring Pandit Pranat to New York, announcing in the pages of the Village Voice in April of that year, Nadam Brahmam, it opens in Sanskrit, sound is God, I am the sound that is God. The article introduced Prandit Pranat as a singer saint, recounting his background and eventual retreat to the mountains where, quote, at the age of 28, Pranat chose to become a naked singing saint, or naga, and so for five years he sat, clothed only in ashes, singing for God. This is the most powerful image Young leaves with the reader, that of the naked yogi, the wandering Sufi singer, whose absolute control over pitch and tone constituted a kind of esoteric science a bridge between the singing of the Vedic gods at the origin of time and the cosmic vibrational physics and neurochemistry of the future shocked freaks. It was perfectly in line with the shifting mood downtown. Gone was the cool Zen reserve and rational skepticism of John Cage and, and Stockhausen. Truth had been found, God had been located, and the counter enlightenment had begun with Pandit Pranath as a spiritual guide and vocal coach and Young and Marion Cezila as his chief apostles, as well as Terry Riley seen here around that time, or at least disciples. Feeling drawn, quote, like iron filings to a magnet, to Pandit Pranat, they took formal initiation as his students and disciples in a ceremony that spring in 1970, beginning a 26-year relationship that would only end, or as they say, shift registers, with Pandit, Pranat, Pandit Pranat's death in 1996. Terry Riley was soon to join them. In May of 1970, Pandit Pranat traveled to California where Terry was living at that time. As Peter Lavazzoli describes it, based on extensive interviews with Riley, having already heard Pandit Pranat's voice on tape, Riley was deeply affected by their first meeting. Unable to comprehend what Pandit Pranat was doing in his singing, Riley was simply mesmerized by the sound of his voice. Riley's time with Pandit Pranat in California was life-changing for both men, foreshadowing Pandit Pranat's eventual shift to the West Coast toward the end of his life and inaugurating Riley's own lifelong formal discipleship to his teacher. For both Young and Zazila, as well as Riley then, the spring of 1970 found them all falling in love. Summer brought parting, but fall found all of them back in Europe, where Riley met up with Pandit Pranat again in France to continue his studies. It wasn't long enough. In the fall, they would all go to India. <clears throat> he d Terry Riley describes the encounter in an interview on KPFA, a radio station in the Bay Area in 1971. He said, just being around him I consider a very great lesson, because it's not only the music, but it's the way he lives and the devotional aspect of the work. And the work is actually, in this case, the worship of God, 
So it goes through every fiber of life. So it's not just music lessons. It's a whole way of life that you have to, uh, you have to recognize and try to work with. And that's Terry Riley and his wife, and with Lamont and Marion on this first trip to India that I'm about to describe. My argument is that the really radical impact of this relationship wasn't in the move away from the piano keyboard skills of the Western tradition towards South Asian microtones and modes, nor in the embrace of improvisation. These were all already happening in an American avant-garde pushing away from European tradition. Nor was it in Young and Riley's move towards very Indianized sounds and performance styles. In fact, they'd also been doing that for years. Uh, even a brief sample of Lamont Young's music recorded in the years before his meeting with Pandit Pranat will show that Hindustani vocal music was already an incredibly strong influence. Riley, too, Terry Riley, when he was not performing vocals with the Theater of Eternal Music, was deeply involved with his own Indian music. OK, fake Indian music, if you must. Though it implies that there's some such thing as real Indian music, a matter best left to philosophers and post-colonial theorists. Now, to me, the really radical impact of Pandit Pranat on Lamont Marion and Terry, and by extension, uh, what happens uh, with many other musicians who came under their influence, what really, the really radical impact was marked by their subordination to a living teacher in the fullest possible sense. And people thought they were nuts. Some still do. This was a confrontation with Eurocentric modernity that went far beyond how a piano was tuned or what drugs to take or where to perform. It was a total rejection of a certain way of thinking about personhood about the role of art, and about knowledge itself. Pran Nat became the guru to a generation of American underground art makers who found it in themselves to stick it to the professors and the gallerists and declare themselves important, to experiment outside the bounds of the acceptable, to estrange themselves into other worlds where old distinctions didn't matter. This was, to borrow from another Bay Area super freak, Philip K. Dick, no less than a divine invasion, one of many in those years, and we were lucky to be on the receiving end of all of them. American music has never been the same. I'm going to close my talk the way I began it, with a trip to India. This trip happened in 1971, but there were no heiresses waiting to meet Lamont and Marion at the Delhi airport when they arrived. Just two kids among a disembarking crowd that must have included other long-haired young Americans given the times. Seekers, charitably. Suckers, less so. There wasn't a marching band or a Courbusier guest house to stay in, just an impecunious and semi-domesticated pundit prawn knot, nevertheless still living en famille in a suburban area just south of New Delhi. They would spend the next half year living with him, rising between 4 and 5 a.m. for daily practice and only taking breaks for excursions out of Delhi that were as much spiritual pilgrimage as sightseeing. Even in the city, their geography was sanctified. If the Cunningham Company was wowed by the U.S. Embassy, Pundit Pran Nat's young charges were immersed in practice, prayer, nature walks along the banks of the Yamuna River, and visits to the dargahs or shrines of Nizamuddin Oliya and Inayat Khan, both located in Delhi. Pundit Pran Nat himself was very religious, albeit heterodox by today's benighted standards, and a regular visitor to both shrines, where sacred sound and quasi-courtly etiquette form fixed points in the sensual swirl of devotees' offerings. Uh, and the smell of roses. The tomb of Amir Khusro is located at one of these shrines, who legend holds invented both the sitar and the Sufi devotional music known as Kawali. What did Lamont and Terry learn there? It wasn't just sound. It was how to behave. It was how to be a human. It was how to not just dig on eternity, not just dream it, but touch it and smell it grab it and never let go. And you can see here some of the sort of courtly etiquette that's involved with performances at these shrines. And this is something that was highly impressive to both men. It's a tomb of Anayat Khan. A postcard from Lamont Young and Marion Zazila to EAT, the organization that had funded their trip in 1971 reads, we have taken trip out of Delhi to make pilgrimage to the tomb of Ustad Wahid Khan Sahab and the shrine of Khan Sahab's spiritual guru on the way to Haridwar. Here we have taken bath in Ganges and had puja ceremony. There is a recommendation letter on file in EAT's archives that is perhaps unique. Signed by Pandit Pranath, 
the type letter exhorts whomever it may concern to give, quote, all possible support to his students Lamont Young and Marion Zazila. What strikes me reading it is that it sounds like it was written by someone else, probably Young or Zazila. What strikes me about reading the above postcard from Lamont Young and Marion to EAT is how much it sounds like it was written by Pandit Pranat. Call it an epistolary chiasmus of the soul, whatever else happened during their first trip to India, Riley Young and Zazila came back as avant sadhus and disciples to the core. Pandit Pranat became an expat, spending the rest of his days for the most part in the United States. Young and Zazila arrived in New Delhi in the middle of February 1971. They had met and begun studying with Pandit Pran Nath in New York in, in January of 1970 and were planning on an extended stay in Delhi under his tutelage. Terry Riley, who like Lamont had become Pandit Pran Nath's formal disciple the year before, was there as well. They spent most of their time in India in a quiet part of South Delhi, staying with Pandit Pran Nath and his family in their home at Kailash Colony. Studying with the strict prawn knot was akin, Terry Riley once told me, to undergoing intense psychoanalysis. During the afternoons, they frequented other parts of the city. It's clear from the transcripts, however, that their EAT-funded India trip was as important for connecting with Pandit Pranath's own sacred geography and lineage as it was for learning the music. It was a connection that yielded, among other things, at least one minor medical miracle. This is from Lamont. One of the first things we did in the course of our trip, our teacher, Pandit Pranat, took us on a pilgrimage. First, we were in Delhi most of the time having lessons every day, waking up early with the sun and practicing a few hours. And then he would take us out and show us parts of Delhi. And later, he took us on a pilgrimage to visit the tomb of his teacher, his guru. And we also went to the tomb of his teacher's spiritual guru as opposed to his teacher's musical guru. And we went to the Ganges at Haridwar to bathe in the Ganges and see what that was all about. And Mary and I had a special puja ceremony on the banks of the Ganga, which is supposed to keep us together for all of eternity. Why don't you tell about this pilgrimage, because you remember the names of the towns better than I do. And then Marion picks it up. We went to the tomb of Pandit Pranath's guru, Ustad Abdul Wahid Khan Sahib, in Saharanpur. I was really surprised to see that it's not only in the middle of the town, not that I thought it would be in a special place. It is in a special place, but it's hard to see immediately. It's sort of behind a garage where work is going on everywhere. It's a small tomb, and there's a little hut next to it, and a little old woman and man live there and attend the grave from time to time. And when we were there, we brought some incense, and when we were there, the woman sort of crept out of her hut and swept the leaves off the stone, and we stood around and had a prayer and thought about this man who had done such a fantastic thing for Indian music and what his connection to us was. What was his connection? For this, we have to go back to the early stages of Pandit Pranat's own occasionally somewhat apocryphal sounding biography. Pandit Pranat was born in Lahore in 1918 to a wealthy Hindu family. He is said to have run away from home at age 13 to live in the house of a singer named Abdul Wahid Khan, first as a servant, then as a student. Khan was a reclusive and Sufi-minded ustad, or master, in one of North India's karanas extended family-based institutions, something like musicians guilds, that combined pedagogy, stylistic peculiarity, and performance. Abdul Wahid Khan's was called Kirana, taking its name from a small town near Delhi where a legendary singer saint named Gopal Nayak had settled some eight centuries ago. According to Gharana lore, the Sultan of Delhi had taken Nayak, the finest musician of his age, in tribute after the sacking of the town of Devgiri, along with the elephants loaded with precious jewels and gold. Nayak then was the first link in a continuous chain of performers that carried his deeply spiritual performance style unchanged to the present day. In fact, this insistence on the living link to an ancient tradition was as much a product of modern anxieties as it was an objective assessment of musical past. Cultural nationalists developed a revisionist historical narrative that sought to minimize the authority of the Karanas, casting them as ignorant and illiterate remnants of a once great and glorious classical read ancient Hindu tradition. The project of proto-nationalist musicology was framed as one of a grand recovery of a lost essence and the formidable, secretive, and predominantly Muslim ustads, often steeped in esoteric religious beliefs, were seen at best as impediments to that project. Reformists, like the Sarabais, were easily scandalized by practices and institutions that failed to conform to their evolving notions of authentic Indian culture, 
and for some of them, the Garnas were embarrassingly visible reminders of India's incoherent medievalism. Increasingly, Hindustani musicians were expected to shoulder the burden of representing not only their own Garana, but the putative Indian nation as well. Understanding the politics of classicism and revival in 20th century Indian music is essential for mapping Pannat's impact on the American avant-garde. To his students in New York, he was the very embodiment of the timeless and unchanging voice of antiquity, and this was a key part of his appeal. But his persona and story, presented by his disciples and improved upon by enthusiastic critics, was very much a legacy of India's early 20th century culture wars. In a milieu that placed musicologists and musicians in opposing camps, laying exclusive claim to the origin was the ultimate trump card. The most successful of the old school ustads carved out a space for themselves by premising their authority on performance rather than transcription, by taking the musicologist's dismissive label of illiterate and turning it into a badge of authenticity. Real Indian music, they suggested, was learned by ear through a process of initiation, repetition, and memorization. Real Indian scales escaped musicologists' staff notation, just as real singers always exceeded the rubrics of Western-derived musicological modernity. In the case of Pandit Pranath's Kiranagarna, this intractable resistance to academia and thorny insistence on the primacy of orality found its natural complement in a style of singing that represented North Indian vocal music at its most, most ethereal, solemn, and majestic. Focused almost entirely on pitch rather than rhythm, on solitary meditative aesthetic experiences rather than entertainment. Hmm. Sorry. At some point in the early 1940s, Pandit Pranath pushed this system of musical values to its logical limit. He took up residence at Tupkeshwar, a cave temple uh, dedicated to the god Shiva near the city of Dehradun in the foothills of the Himalayas, and lived there as an ascetic for five years. According to his students, much of that time was spent singing a single note, the Sharaja, accompanied by the sound of the stream that rushed past his hermit cell. So Pandit Pranath has said that his daily practice when he was living in a cave at this temple site was that he would stand in this little river and sing a single note using the river as his drone. And actually, there's a, there's a film that was made in the 80s of Pandit Pranat where he talks about this, and he's sitting right near there, and he's sort of listening, and then he starts singing the note that, that the stream uh, is, is playing. Uh, the story goes that in the late 1940s, his old teacher, Abdul Wahid Khan, near death, tracked him down at Tupkeshwar and beseeched him to abandon the ascetic life take a family, and teach the Kirana style of singing. A newly independent India was being born, the subcontinent divided. Pandit Pranath came down from the mountains. In the spring of 1971, with Lamont Young, Marion Zazila, and Terry Riley in tow, he went back for a visit, leading his young charges on a tour of holy sites in the foothills of the Himalaya, taking in Dehradun and the holy city of Haridwar on the Ganges, and meeting with figures ranging from Pandit Pranath's own spiritual teacher to uh, other ascetics that he had hung out with. Lamont Young says, an interesting thing about meeting Pandit Pranath's spiritual teacher was that before we went to India, Marion had been diagnosed as having a hyperthyroid condition about a month or so before we left, and it was very serious. And one doctor wanted her to take the radioactive iodine treatment, which destroys part of the thyroid. And we didn't really want her to take it, but wanted it cured by more natural means. So we wrote to Pandit Pranath and asked him to have his Swami pray for Marion. And then about two and a half, half weeks later, we went to another doctor and had the same test taken. And she was had about a 40% improvement. And he said she didn't have to take the medication and that she was OK and could go to India. Their trip to the streamside caves where Pandit Pranat had once lived and practiced was time to coincide with a major Hindu religious festival called Shivaratri. Throngs number in the hundreds of thousands still arrive at Tupkeshwar for the yearly festival. A report from last year's in the Pioneer newspaper describes long serpentine queues forming at midnight the night before of devotees waiting to pay homage to the eponymous self-created image or lingam of the god Shiva, which takes the form of a mighty stalagmite constantly moistened by drips from a correspondingly miraculous stalactite just above. 
Uh, the typically high pitch of a popular Hindu festival is considerably amplified in the case of North Indian Shivratri by the consumption of massive quantities of cannabis. And this is an image of a government authorized cannabis store. Uh, apparently last year, more than a dozen cases of cannabis overdose were admitted to the local hospital during this festival. It's hard to imagine. The young disciples felt right at home. An aerogram letter they sent back to New York describing the trip summed it up with three words, true Shiva feeling. <laughs> the trip effectively drew to a close on April 10th, 1971, and a letter from Terry Riley to Billy Kluver, who was the director of EAT, the organization that funded this trip, captures the mood. Kluver had perhaps understandably been urging Terry Riley, Lamont Young, someone, to get themselves to Ahmedabad, to the National Institute of Design there and to give a workshop or two, meet some people of real consequence. And anyway, in his proposal for the trip, Terry Riley had written of his desire to visit the electronic mus music studio there in order to demonstrate some of my music, as he wrote, to Indian musicians. But by April 10th, things had changed. Connecting with the Indian music studio was not a priority. He wrote, Dear Billy, got your telegram. Unfortunately, I must leave India in less than two weeks with no time to get away to Ahmedabad. I've been working here in Delhi for six months, 10 to 12 hours a day practicing North Indian raga and having daily lessons from Pandit Pranath. I found that the study of these raga is so important that I haven't done anything else since I've been here. I've dropped all my other work just to work with Pandit Pranath, and he is coming with me when I return to the States. We should be there around April 10th, and I will come to see you so we can discuss in detail what I've been doing. As it turns out, my original projects got submerged by the work I got into with Pranath, and it's not possible to say where it will all lead or whether I can bring this information back to a technological framework. Time will tell. And I'll just close here by showing you what, how Pandit Pranath performances in New York were uh, typically advertised. The, the earliest performances were almost universally held in loft spaces or in galleries, and, and that included Larry Poon's. One of the very first was actually held at that same space, the Four Heavens, run by Larry Poon's. Pundit Pranat, in the years to come, would establish himself as a very successful uh, singer in the sense that he had major records released through, through Terry Riley and Lamont Young's influence, but he also became quite a notable teacher of vocal music. You didn't have to become a disciple just to study with Pandit Pranat. You could just go and, and take a few lessons. And if you really take in the list of, of the people who did that, it includes people ranging from Don Cherry to Brian Eno. And to really track the influence of, of, Lamont Young, or of, of Pandit Pranat through the music scene in New York in the 1970s, which is something I did in an article for Badoon Magazine in 2010, you see that there are deep ties not only to the, to the sort of drone-based electronic minimalism that he's most closely associated with, but also to the early stages of ambient music, new age music, and world music as well. And these are all aspects of, of sort of uh, Pundit Pranath's history that have been downplayed by, by New York-based critics who find all of those things to be silly and, and, and somewhat scandalous. Um, I think I'll just close there and, and, and let anybody ask any questions. I know that was a lot of, a lot of material. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a fair word, I think, yeah. And I mean, it's a, it's a charged word, yeah, but well, it is a charged word. it's I mean, become it's more charged. Really 
applied ornamentation, mm. stylistic ornamentation. And so, you know, having taken his, having been influenced by his agricultural um, experience and having used that in his compositional processes right. or thinking, um, you know, it still does not, it still does not, uh, it is still not inscribed within a kind of like larger world music thing. Um, I mean, and this is where I think where Lamont Young is a little bit trapped in this, and that you know, and, and, and I'm I'm not sure, but it may be it might be an entry point of critique. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe, I mean the thing is, is that like this whole um, this whole uh, attachment or incorporation of uh, Oriental philosophy, um, not so much, not so much. Um, not so much about like instrumentation, but like philosophy is very much. I mean, for me, uh, for me, like Cage. Was now, see, Cage is into philosophy, but Lamont doesn't care about. It. I mean, that's, that's the thing. see, Lamont. Lamont likes to tell miraculous stories. See, what I find amazing about Lamont's relationship with India, as someone who had my own long, very long relationship with the place. Um, is that you know if you look at the early period through the 60s he's so unburdened by most actual information or anything that he's able to just play act this fantasy india make up new myths that sort of draw from like books but essentially it's just this wild like heady like made up thing right. and I think that Masota really nails it and and re, and, and and that's 1966 and it's just like this is totally hokey like that's basically like if I were in, he's not on enough drugs he doesn't want to like be a part of this scene with a bunch of long haired people sitting in yogic positions listening to the theater of eternal music drone for six hours he finds it banal he describes it as banal uh, and I think that like Lamont himself realized that he reached a limit with that with that approach to India maybe and that this pundit pran not encounter of course it happens at just the right time 1967 it it, it sort of you notice, I noticed myself very clearly the shift in tone in his writing towards like, whoa, he's really, now he really seems to like be involved with India on a real level. Like what he says, his writing turns into like a, a very pundit pranat esque type of voice. And it's, and again, like there isn't this abstraction into philosophy that you would find with Cage. Cage wants to find an abstract aspect to Indian thought that he can then apply to his own music. Lamont literally just wants to become pundit pranat. He, he, both him and Terry Riley explicitly say that it's not about learning the music, it's about learning how to behave, it's about learning how to be a person, it's about learning to be, uh, emulate this model of the guru in a total way. So there's this, there's this very anti-philosophical aspect to it where it's just memorization and rote repetition in terms of musical learning, but also just this whole model of human behavior in terms of, of, of personal living, and they still, you know, I have to say, they, they, they still maintain all of this stuff. It's, it's, it, it really took, and in fact, Terry Riley himself is now a guru and has many students. Um, they, they can, and so Lamont does too, I guess, but Lamont's so weird, he's hard to work with. Yeah, I, I mean, Lamont is a very eccentric guy, uh, yeah. but I, I don't think I answered your question at all. No, no I, I And it's not just Cage and Lamont Young, right? No, it's of course not. It's also Oliveros, it's also like... Sure, all there's, many, there's many other... I, yeah. think that, I think that there's, a, there's an especially interesting um, thing to say about like their, their, uh, their leaning towards this oriental... ...at that time, it sort of permutates in different ways. Yeah, um... I, one of the ways I got into this research was because I became really interested in exploring the modality of discipleship as as a, as a way of operating within the New York avant-garde during this right. period. So right now I'm working on a, a long piece about the dancer Viola Farber, who you saw earlier on the Cunningham tour. She was a lifelong devotee of Meher Baba, an Indian godman of the 1930s, who was silent for his almost his entire adult life. And many of his disciples also observed days of silence, including Viola. She became legendary in the Cunningham Company well before John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds for her days of silence, which annoyed everybody and, anew and amused them as well. And so it's kind of like creating alternative genealogies for silence. Uh, that's one of the things I'm trying to do with that article. And also to talk about how, what an outsized influence Meher Baba had 
on the, Indi on the New York dance world of the 1950s, everything from Paul Taylor, Merce Cunningham, but also the American Ballet Theater. I mean, if you really look at it, uh, Meher Baba made a concerted effort to infiltrate, in a sense, the modern dance world in New York in the 1950s, and it worked. And if you try to re-describe the New York dance world using that as a, as a sort of heuristic device, you come up with an incredibly interesting map that defies typical categorizations of ballet versus modern versus Broadway, because he had dancers, who, uh, disciples, who were, were part of you know, all of those worlds. I'm curious, are there any accounts of uh, um, by uh, Prana on, on the whole experience? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, he was interviewed. Uh, his English remained very limited. Okay. He eventually took American citizenship and bought a house in Berkeley. Uh, another, another of my projects is actually, that I, I'm hoping to get to later this year, is about his death, because uh, he died surrounded by disciples and they all had these miraculous visions and dreams the nights after. And like, there's this whole West Coast story to Punit Pranat. I felt like the Punit Pranat, when he arrives in, in the US, uh, obviously he's, he's has so much projected fantasies onto him, but that over time, he dies in 1996, essentially you see his own goals and, and sort of intentions clarify to the point where like by the end of his life, he's built this very intense group of disciples and students on the West Coast, many of whom are Sufis, like neo-Sufis, white Sufis, many of whom are, are sort of neo-Hindus. And he's kind of created this world for himself where he's very comfortable and, and that seems very Indian. And, and he didn't want to go back to India. He bought a house in Berkeley and, and died surrounded by these students. So in a sense, he was able to create a much more sort of self-directed world. I feel like in 1970, he was stuck in Lamont land and that you know his shift to the West Coast as the years went by accompanied a kind of clarification of what he wanted to be as an American. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I saw you've been trained. Yes. Well, again, that's another. That's yeah. Lamont Young is often associated with industrial music, partly because of the music that he made in the 1970s, this drone-based minimalism, um, but also partly because of things like the two sounds piece that I played from when he was already doing these things, in like the trio for strings in 1958, which is one of his earliest. Uh, 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 like sort of serial type compositions itself is very minimal and if it's played amplified might sound like really like sano or something like you know what I mean like you'll hear like drone rock is certainly emerges from a lot of the the electronics of theater eternal music as well and yeah just this so I, I think that people who are interested in the origins of industrial music often look to New York in the 1960s when you had multimedia performances using electronic drones and live uh, instruments and singing. Uh, yeah. But again, you know, like to Pandit Pran, not, not, you know, it would be very hard to say that he, <laughs> his, his ties are much more closely related to like new age okay. or ambient music. And again, these are like things that have typically embarrassed uh, musicologists and music historians. And that's why I'm interested in them. Again, this is this modality of discipleship comes with scandal. I, I always felt that uh, the way people speak in just glowing and sort of uncritical terms about John Cage's uh, American Zen, which itself is completely concocted, and, and not, uh, uh, John Cage's Zen is acceptable because it's rational, because it has no guru, because for him, I Ching is just a method for creating indeterminacy. Yeah, exactly. It's, exactly, he, he kind of blanks American Zen just into a sort of program for art. That's totally acceptable. This crosses to the point where, like, what have, you know, what's going on here? And, and uh, yeah, that, that, that interested me very much, that if you take something like John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence and say, this is such a seminal epochal thing, like, where does the silence come from? Well, of course, it comes from Zen. Well, I don't know. Actually, there's a lot of other sources for silence. In the, in, and, and, of course, we could talk about John Cage's own repressed sexuality is another source for silence, but, um, and, you know, and I think that should be uh, brought up, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, in, I'm interested in alternative genealogies for downtown conceptualism, ones that avoid just the typical language of patrilineage, as Mir Shore puts it, and uh, looks um, towards maybe disciples and devotees. It's just scandalous figures that, that poke an eye into that narrative. Yeah.
and 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 yeah. Yes. It seems. I mean, your uh, one of the most memorable uh, phrases that you used is this uh, image of these long-haired Americans coming up with things as seekers or suckers. Um, but it's very interesting that the trip that you describe about coming down the cage, uh, they seem to be the suckers. Hmm. Uh, they uh, and I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's because of cages. Um, reluctance to uh, fully immerse himself in uh, this in this sort of guruism uh, sort of state or maybe it's because uh, even though they didn't have official western sponsorship they were sort of a remnant of this uh, western uh, push towards a, of, a, of a formalism over Soviet realism that was going on at the time uh, and so they were, even though they weren't officially Western propaganda, they were still very well, much Western propaganda. But don't forget that Rauschenberg, who is the company's artistic director, had just won the painting prize in Venice, the first American to do so. And there was definitely American government involvement in LA, and that it caused a massive scandal. And people were protesting in the streets in Venice. Other people were cheering. So there was a propagandistic edge, certainly to Rauschenberg's uh, tour of the world in 1964. Cage never wanted to propagandize for the U.S. government. He was such an anarchist. But you're very right that, like, in a sense, like Cage, Cage, Cage can't really be blamed for not knowing what India was like in, in 1964. He had never been there. His introduction had just been through these, these, these sort of like very compressed synoptic little potted surveys and things. And and Kumaraswamy's books. It's interesting, though, that the thing that he really takes away is that nature is not to be imitated in her form, but in her manner of operation. This is a dictum that he takes from one of Kumaraswamy's books on Indian aesthetics. I don't even know if that's Indian, but it doesn't matter. He thinks it is. And But if you think about it, it's very, now put that back into this. Now, of course, for Lamont Young, replace nature with Pandit Prana. You know, so for Lamont Young, Indian music is exactly something to be imitated in its manner of operation, or I mean in its form, yes. and its manner of operation. Whereas Cage already is basically by, you can kind of see him pushing away from Indian music even by taking and latching onto that dictum. He's going to say that Indian music should not be imitated in its form, but Indian aesthetics should be imitated in their manner of operation. That's what he wants out of India. He can't get it though, because it's not there. Yeah, because yeah. it, it wasn't there in the first place. It was just an idea from a book that that he that he took and did something absolutely wonderful which with and why changed I wish everything. Many, I wish the same thing for many of the long-haired suckers who come to India looking for enlightenment. Absolutely. Why are getting a swindle? Uh, so it's it, it's it's very lucky that Riley actually found someone who actually. Yeah. Uh, but, they would, yeah, they wouldn't describe it as luck, but you're right. I mean, they did, Pandit Pranat was not an acquisitive person. He was not, he was not a, uh, a fraud on any level. I wish I had good sound equipment. I could play some Pandit Pranat singing, the kind of thing that when they heard it, I totally know what he means because I, I had a similar experience myself when I first started listening to Pandit Pranat, and that's kind of like what forced me into all this research is that he's able to do things with the tone of his voice and with the timbre of his voice that are just almost indescribable. He's able to put shivers through his voice, microtonal, tiny shivers. These are all aspects of Indian music that are well understood uh, and totally theorized. But Pandit Pranath's total control over the timbre of his voice, I, I can't think of anybody else who can sing like that. Also his like slow, very low voice. He sings very slowly and very low and in perfect pitch. And then he's able to put these shivers and things like that, 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 yeah, once you start listening to them, can, I, I can see, totally understand how Terry Riley and Lamont Young, when they first heard it, said, uh-uh, this, this is something, you know, because they'd heard a lot of Indian music, and they, and they hadn't been moved to go study with Ali Akbar Khan at the College of Music in the Bay Area or anything like that. To them, that was all commercial crap. Yeah. It wasn't until they heard, they thought they knew what Indian music was better than, than Ali Akbar Khan. <laughs> so when they heard Pandit Pranath, they were like, now that's Indian music. I mean, it's ridiculous, but again, no, no more or less ridiculous than Cage, I suppose. Just as perverse. Um, how was Tony Kumar, who just died, by the way? What's it? Tony Kumar. Oh, yeah, of course. Related to 
Well, Tony Conrad was a member of the Theater of Eternal Music. This is, so, this is the worst, uh, this is such a complicated question. The reason that it's really difficult to hear Theater of Eternal Music is because almost none of it's been released. It's all in Lamont's studio on tape. They recorded every rehearsal. There must be hundreds of recordings of the Theater of Eternal Music in very high fidelity, the highest, because Lamont had good audio equipment. So Lamont is sitting on a massive archive. Tony Conrad and John Cale, who were both key members of the Theater of Eternal Music, and John Cale went, later went on to be one of the founders of, of the Velvet Underground, along with Angus McLeese, also from the Theater of Eternal Music, and this is how we get into Drone Rock. But uh, they claimed, they didn't call it the Theater of Eternal Music, they called it the Dream Syndicate, or sometimes they just called it Dream Music. And they saw it as a collaboration. They didn't see Lamont as the leader of the group. So they insisted to Lamont that if he were ever to release the music, that it has to be co-credited to all of them, whereas Lamont won't do that. He says it's his music. Yeah, no, he refused. And he's, he will, he refused, he'll refuse to credit anybody who he doesn't think deserves it. It's very important to him to uh, maintain this sort of uh, composer's control over the, the music. And uh, he outlasted Tony Conrad. To a certain extent, though, I have to say that having been through all of these documents myself, uh, lots, uh, I've spent many years of my life looking at this material, um, I have to come down on Lamont's side on this one. Tony Conrad and John Kill were both really young. They had no career going at all when they started playing with the Theater of Eternal Music. Every account from Oscar Masotas to Jill Johnston's to whatever critic you want to mention will say Lamont Young's group. Contemporary audiences had had no confusion about whose music it was. Tony Conrad in later years, Tony Conrad didn't do a lot in later years with music. I mean, he, he recorded this record with Faust in 1970, uh, which is, you know, was kind of great. Then he went to Cornell and kind of spent, or Buffalo, I'm sorry, and, and became a, a professor basically forever. Later on, he released his own minimalism recordings, which were actually re-recordings he made in the 90s, and he claimed that these anticipated Lamont. To me, the Tony Conrad argument is like, where does that even come from? John Kill is a guy who described theater of eternal music as uh, hypnotism mingled with malevolence. And like Don, John Cale himself was quite, quite a malevolent figure, you know, like I, I just don't, I don't take their claims very seriously. Terry Riley certainly supports that he wasn't a collaborator. He, he totally gives all credit to Lamont for Theater of Eternal Music. So is everybody else who ever played with them, John Hassel, et cetera. So to me, that was just a stupid fight. And unfortunately, it never got resolved before Tony Conrad died. Uh, with, uh, by, no, not oh yeah, and like, oh of course, yeah, yeah. No, he he developed his, you know, he did he did all these incredible things, the yellow paintings and whatnot. I mean, he's a conceptualist, and he did all these great conceptual things. But my point is, I don't know why he needs to lay claim to this music of 1964, 1963, 1965, um, when to my mind, it it just seems clear that that everybody who saw it and the way it was presented and everything was always as Lamont's music. And you can read the program notes. I mean, there, it's difficult for me to adjudicate the claim, but um, I'm, I'm gonna come down on Lamont's side. But that is, that is Tony Conrad's uh, involvement. And I think that by 1966, he was leaving. I don't think he played with the theater of music after 1966, so, or 67. So it was a very short period of time, actually, we're talking about, but with hundreds and hundreds of tapes. Uh, this is something about Lamont that pisses everyone off, because he not only has all of those, he has all of Richard Maxfield's tapes, he has a bunch of other, he's, he's sort of Angus MacLeese. Um, another. Are you going to listen to some of these tonight? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, we're going to listen to, I have bootlegs of everything, of course, <laughs> which is illegal. Sorry, Lamont, and if he knew, he'd never speak to me again, that's so why I didn't want to. <laughs> Sorry. No, he won't get that far. He's pretty late. No, uh, I have bootlegs of everything, but, uh, you know, that's been out. And they've been kind of traded among record collectors for years. So we'll listen to some good theater of eternal music tonight. And I hope you guys can make it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.